Central banks across the world have been fighting high inflation for more than two years after a series of shocks pushed up energy and food prices. They've made great progress, but the fight isn't quite over yet. Inflation isn't yet back to target, interest rates are still restrictive, and economic, geopolitical and environmental uncertainties pose major challenges for our economies and for policymakers. This year's ECB Forum on Central Banking brought together central bankers and academics from across the world to meet in Sintra in Portugal to discuss monetary policy in an era of transformation. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Paul Gordon. At this year's ECB Forum, President Christine Lagarde, U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, and Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, Roberto Campos Neto, sat down to discuss the steps they've taken to fight inflation and the road ahead. The conversation was moderated by CNBC's Sarah Eisen. Let's listen to what they had to say. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so honored to be back on this stage. We were here a year ago, and it is my also great pleasure to welcome three people who need no introduction in this room. Chair Powell from the Federal Reserve, President Lagarde, our, our host from the European Central Bank, and President Campos Neto from Brazil. This time <coughs> last year, when we were all talking, you guys were, were in the sort of final process of hiking rates. Fast forward one year, and now it's interesting. While, while I'm going to miss Governor Weta and his jokes, <laughs> we've got three great panelists here going at different speeds, I would say, when it comes to reversing that course. So we'd love to just open it up, President Lagarde, with you and ask, where are you in this process? Because you cut in June, so now what? Well, it's been, it's been a journey. You can't just say, oh, we cut in June. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's coming on the, on, on, you know, on the back of a, a period of hikes, which was unprecedented, facing shocks that I tried to describe yesterday over dinner, and followed by a period during which we held rates untouched, and during which we, uh, we were restrictive enough to actually um, see our medium-term target reach that 2%, which is our objective. And uh, most recently, we have seen in our round of projections, which are really important, <coughs> September, December, March, March, and June, we've seen that 2% target uh, with an oscillation of 0.1 about it um, at the last quarter of 2025. So it's on that basis and on the basis of what I'm happy to describe as you know, the, the, the three-leg reaction function and all the underlying data and information that feeds those three legs that we decided to uh, do a 25 basis points cuts. But in the same breath of air, I also said that it was not a linear process, that it was not a predetermined path that we were embarking upon but uh, a, a step that would be followed by further review of data, further understanding of where our three legs uh, reaction function would be. So that, that's pretty much where we are. And I would simply maybe add that we are very advanced in that disinflationary uh, path. And we are in that sort of um, slow recovery uh, which uh, came about during the first quarter and which uh, we hope will um, persevere, but all of that is flawed with uncertainties and big question mark about the future. Sounds again. like you're setting up the market for a pause now. Is that right? I'm not setting up anything for you know anyone. <laughs> I think that it's for everyone to really look into, look un under the skin of the economy and and see where it's where it's heading and appreciating what our reaction function is and how we're likely to uh, to decide. Chair Powell, you have also been on a journey and have been on hold since last July, have not cut rates like the ECB in June. Why not? What are you waiting for? So let me say that um, sitting here last year, we didn't, we, there was a lot we didn't know, and we didn't know that we were just about to embark on a, on a period of seven months of much lower inflation readings. We didn't realize that the second half of last year was going to be an extraordinary year from a growth standpoint, and also from the standpoint of the labor market. So, Things actually worked out in the second half of last year in a remarkable way. Then, as you know, in the first quarter of this year, 
Um, we continue to have uh, solid growth in the first half, actually, solid growth, and a labor market that's still strong, although we've seen uh, a continued rebalancing in the labor market. Um, and inflation, after, after pausing in the, in the first quarter, now shows signs of resuming its disinflationary trend. So it's a little bit different journey. So where that, where that leaves us is um, <clears throat> we've made quite a bit of progress in bringing inflation back down to our target. While the labor market has remained strong and growth has continued, we want that process to continue. I think the last reading and, and the one before it to uh, an inflation, the one before it to a less ex lesser extent, do suggest that we are getting back on a, on a disinflationary path. We want to be more confident that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2% before we start the process of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, how tight the, our, our policy is, of, of loosening policy. And that's what we've said. And what, we would, what we'd like to see is more data like, like what we've been seeing recently. We'd also like to see the labor market remain strong. We've said that if we saw the labor market um, unexpectedly weakening, weakening that could, is also something that could, that could call for a reaction. How, how much more confident do you want to be? The PCE number 2.6, that wasn't too bad that we got last week. That's right. So we're actually on a 12-month basis. We're actually at 2.6, both headline and core for inflation. And that's that's, that represents really significant progress. I think we peaked at 5.4% in core. And the same thing has happened in, in headline. We've gone from 7.1 to 2.6. So yes, we've made a lot of progress. We, wanted, we just want to understand that, that, that the levels that we're seeing are a true reading on what is actually happening with underlying inflation. And as we were saying at the last part of last year, people were saying, you need to declare victory. This is over. And then we had a quarter of inflation which was well above 3%. So, we want to be more confident, and frankly, because the U.S. economy is strong and the labor market is strong, we have the ability to take our time and get this right, and that, that's what we're planning to do. So, September? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be landing on any, any specific dates here today. Let me also say that we're, we're well aware that if we go too soon, that we could undo the good work we've done in bringing down uh, inflation, <coughs> and if we go too late, we could unnecessarily undermine the recession, the uh, the recovery, and uh, the expansion, and uh, and so we, we're aware that we have two-sided risks now, more so than we did a year ago. That's a big change. I'd say risks are coming much more into balance now. President Campos, you have been on a different journey because you've actually been cutting rates for much of the last year and mm -hmm. have recently paused. Why? What are you seeing in inflation data, and what are you going to do next? Okay, so if you go back a little bit um, in the history of time. So Brazil was one of the first countries to hike rates. Um, I think in part because we had a different call on the dynamics of inflation, both locally and globally. And I think that turned out to, um, to be correct. Um, and then at some point in time, we started uh, the, easy, the easing cycle. Um, and throughout this, this process of easing, um, we've seen that inflation has converged uh, we have some of the problems that are common to uh, advanced economies and other Latin American countries, which is labor markets very strong. So um, there were two points of attention. One was labor market being that strong, would that at some point in time mean inflation in the service and the service side? And even though we haven't seen that yet, what we try to do is we try to estimate <coughs> what would be the components of labor in every service so that we can anticipate if that were to happen. Uh, we haven't seen it, but we think it's, you know, there is uh, somewhat of a correlation when you look at the margin. And so um, most recently we decided to pause. Um, that had to do not only with the current numbers and with this uh, suspicion that uh, we had service inflation that could peak at some point in time, and also because food prices uh, we're going back up a little bit, and it's, I, don't, I also think that's not only happening in Brazil, it's going to happen in some other places too. Um, but also has to do with a lot of noises that we had. Uh, so we decided to interrupt uh, the cycle. Um, more recently, we've had had a sell-off in some of the emerging market countries. Brazil was more affected. Um, but I think has, this has to do much more with noises that were created than the fundamentals. And the noises are related to two channels. One is the expectation on the path of fiscal policy, and the other one is expectation on the future of monetary policy. So when you had these two at the same time, I think it created uncertainty enough that for us, uh, uh, we needed to interrupt and see uh, how we can fix that channel. 
and how we can communicate better so that we can eliminate th those noises. Because there is a big disconnection mm -hmm. with the current data, both fiscal and, money and, and inflation data, and the expectations. So what happened in Brazil is the expect expectations started to de-anchor, even though the current data is coming as, as expected. Right. So you're talking about the, the fall in the stock market and the real recently when you talk about the markets. But for us, what matters is how this gets into our reaction function. So I'm talking about expected inflation, the long end of interest rate curve. So we had a, uh, somewhat of a steepening of the interest, interest rate curve. We had a devaluation of the currency. But for us, what matters is the expected inflation, both implied inflation from the markets and expected inflation from the surveys, um, those have gone up. Yeah, I mean, President Lagarde, you have described the path to 2% as bumpy. We got an inflation report in the Eurozone this morning, 2.5%, not too bad, but core was high and services are still above 4%. So what is keeping prices so sticky? Well, first of all, we had, as you said, a number that was uh, lower than last month. So we said it was bumpy and uh, it's proving heading in the right direction for the indicator that we use, which is HICP, to measure inflation and to set our target. So that, that's, that's good. Uh, but we still believe that it, it's likely to be a bumpy road uh, until the end of uh, 2024. But we still have target uh, at the end, in the second half of 2025, on the basis of uh, our projections. And the baseline is unequivocal uh, on that front. You are correct that um, services hasn't budged. So services is at 4.1, if I um, remember from the, uh, the numbers that we got this morning. And obviously, we are very attentive to the components and what is behind services. And the real issue is to understand whether those are, uh, this is caused by sort of permanent changes or whether it is also a factor of the lag effects of other components which are finding their way more slowly and gradually into services. And the jury is out as to exactly what it is. The truth of the matter is that we do have a service number that has gone slightly up in the recent months and which is now staying at this 4.1 percentage points. Now, obviously, we don't need to have services at 2% because manufacturing uh, goods are below 2%. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a balance between goods and services, and it depends on the weight of those uh, within the index. But we have to look really what is behind it. And what's behind it is a lot of wages. Services has a, a very high component of uh, labor. Wages also suffer from the lag impact of the labor system that we have in Europe, where clearly um, bargaining agreements are negotiated not only on an annual basis in some country, but sometimes on a triennial basis in other countries. So you have this catch-up effect. You know, for those people whose renegotiation took place early this year, they had not had a negotiation of wages in the last three years. In the meantime, of course, inflation uh, went up and their real wages went down. So there is an element of catch-up. So we need to really uh, unpack all that uh, to, to get to, the, to the, the, the root causes of inflation behind services. So we will be, we'll continue to look at that. We need data. It applies to wages. It applies to profits because we, we are seeing profit gradually declining compared to the height where they weren't at the end of uh, 22. But we need to see those profits absorbing uh, the, the, the wage cost increases uh, to make sure that the second round effect is out of the window and services are, are also going to be on a declining path as well. Can but I services is, this, is, is the difficult one. I was just going to pose that Taylor Swift is touring Europe this summer. <laughs> and there tends to be an inflationary effect in services. Am I right, Chair Powell? We saw it last year, didn't we? <laughs> it's not just Taylor Swift. You know, others have come as well. Larry Sprit. Yeah. I don't know. I saw her at Wembley, and there was a lot of spending going on. No, but. How, how do you look at the services, the stickiness of the services inflation and how tied it is to wages, which have been rising? You know, famously, services inflation is stickier, and famously, it's tied to, um, to wages. I would say, so look at the U.S. labor market. We've seen um, 
a pretty substantial move toward better balance than we had a couple of years ago when labor was in you know, extreme shortage. So what you see now is an unemployment rate that's moving back up toward a more sustainable level. You see wages moving, wage increases moving back down toward a, a sustainable level of wage increases, inflation, and productivity. Uh, and uh, you see you know, vacancies to unemployment ratio coming back to where it was pre-pandemic and so many other measures I could, I could mention. So that's what we're seeing. And so the, the labor market, wages, wage increases are still a bit above where they, where they would wind up in equilibrium. But nonetheless, you can see the labor market is, is you know, cooling off, appropriately so, and we're watching it very carefully. But it doesn't look like, that's, uh, it doesn't look like it's heating up or presenting a big problem for inflation going forward. Indeed, it looks like it's doing just what you would want it to do, which is to cool off over time, not quickly, not suddenly, not steeply. It's kind of what we've been hoping to see and have, have been seeing. So, and you know, services generally are, they're such a mixed bag, particularly non-housing services are a mixed bag. Some of what you're seeing is catch up inflation from inflationary pressures that happened earlier. You know that's true with insurance. It's also true with housing services inflation where you've got some pent up uh, 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 rent increases that have to work their way off. It turns out it takes more than one year for that to happen, it takes several years. So we see all that in train and you know we don't see ourselves getting back to 2% inflation this year or next year, but or maybe late next year, but in, in the year after. The main thing is we're making real progress. Is it, can you keep cutting um, President Lagarde if he keeps holding? <laughs> Does it make it harder? Well, look, you know, I'm going to give you the conventional response uh, because that's <laughs> the conventional question you ask me. Um, <laughs> we do take into account uh, the spillover impact of whatever is decided by other esteemed colleagues. And obviously, my esteemed friend, um, Chair Powell, is, is one of those. So we, we take that into account, but we also determine, you know, our monetary policy on the basis of what we see in our economy, and, uh, and we look at uh, the data that we get, uh, the impact that multiple factors have on, uh, on, our, on our economies and, uh, and its numbers. Does it matter for you, President Kampos, what the Fed does next? Well, I think it, it, it matters to an extent, but I think there is one point that is worth mentioning, which is more recently we've seen a sell-off in some of the EM and especially the EM that had more, um, there were like more the, uh, the, the best cases for investment. Um, and you see that this is being explained with local news. But when you have a lot of sell-offs in different markets and they're all explained by local news, you have to ask yourself if there is a, a more fundamental factor driving that. Um, and I think there might be. Um, it's difficult to, to make the case right now, but definitely what, what we see now is uh, there is more risk premium in a lot of the emerging market countries. Um, and it was very synchronized with the long end of the US curve. And that correlation broke. So we've seen the last couple of weeks that even though the 10-year yield is more or less stable, even actually going a little bit lower, we saw a bit of a sell-off in emerging market countries. And I think that has to do with the fact that as you go um, for longer with higher rates and much higher debt, you start extracting liquidity from the market, and eventually you are repricing that liquidity. Uh, it could just be a temporary adjustment in EM, or it could, it could be the beginning of a more uh, profound movement. We need to wait, uh, to, to wait and see. But I think the correlation between the US Treasury and some of the EM has been broken in the last couple of weeks. And, and I think we should, hmm. uh, uh, we should pay attention to that. What about the fundamentals in emerging markets? Because the economies seem to do better during this hiking cycle than they have previously. Why do you think that is? And, and does it continue? I think most EMs did a better job in, uh, in terms of, or at least an equal job in terms of anticipating the process and starting the hiking pr uh, process. <clears throat> also in the fiscal part, um, on average, emerging market countries spent more or less 10% of GDP uh, facing the pandemic. Advanced economies spend a little bit more than 20. So I think there is also this, um, this thing which you know, didn't happen in the past, which is by and large, emerging markets were able to deal with the pandemic spending less. Um, and actually, when you look at the fiscal post-pandemic, 
um, emerging market continues. Uh, it's not the case of every country, but continues mm -hmm. to do a little bit better. So I think that also um, uh, make uh, change the dynamics. And one other thing is I think the independence of the central bank and the maturity that a lot of the central banks have gained in emerging market proved to be very useful uh, during this, um, this process of the pandemic. I mean, a lot, all of your economies did better than expected with the, with the interest rate hikes, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Chair Powell? Yes, yes, I think uh, particularly, uh, yeah, I mean, many, many forecasters had a recession for in 2023, which not only turned out to be wrong in the case of the U.S., we had well in excess of 3% growth, so. But you still see policy as restrictive? Yes, we do. How restrictive? Well, so that's kind of an empirical question. So I, I guess I would say, if you look at, we do, we do think policy is restrictive, and we think that's appropriate. Um, I think if you look at the labor market in particular, you're seeing demand for labor gradually come down in the form, form of job openings and now a, a slight softening in unemployment in, in, in the form of wages. You see demand coming down, not just the supply that we're getting, but also demand coming down. You also see the effects of, uh, of interest, high interest rates in the housing market and in some other interest rate sensitive things. So you see that. And um, I, I think, you know, I do think that restrictive policy is working hand in hand with this broad supply side recovery we've had where we've seen the unwinding of the shortages and bottlenecks from the pandemic. We've also seen a recovery in labor force participation among prime age individuals in the US and then uh, some immigration, which has also been a positive supply shock. So we've seen all those things work together to give us you know, really significant declines in inflation. At the same time, we've got a strong labor market and growth. Now, this was, this was a, a much, it's a great outcome for the people that we serve and it's one that we want to do everything we can to foster. So why not just cut rates to protect it? It's what I said earlier. You know, we, we, is it um, a bigger risk, it, sorry, I'll rephrase. Is it a bigger risk that you cut prematurely and inflation stays sticky or that you wait too long and the economy loses mo more momentum? You know, that is the question. And so, the, and our answer to the, <laughs> our, our answer to the question is you, you, we serve a dual mandate, right? And if these two things are embodied in that mandate. You don't, you, the risk on, on the inflation side is that you move too quickly, inflation comes back, and we didn't really solve the problem. Uh, and then we have to go back in, and that would be, that would be very disruptive uh, to the economy. So the other risk is that we wait too long. We understand that, and the labor market softens too much, perhaps we lose, we lose the expansion, you know? So, Needless to say, we don't want to do that either. So, but at the same time, so we've got to balance those two. And again, given, given the strength we see in the US economy, we can, we can approach that question carefully. But I, as I said earlier though, you, you see a year or so ago, we were talking about inflation and our framework called for us to focus on the variable, the, the mandate that is further from its goal. That's not, they've come back much closer into balance. And a good way to see it is, is the, the beverage curve analysis that everybody, everybody talks about and looked about, looks at. We, you know, we've come straight down the beverage curve, which you're really getting to that place relative to job openings and, and hiring rates where traditionally the beverage curve is flattened out, which, means, which would mean higher unemployment as a result of further declines in, in, um, in job openings. So we don't, you can't know that with precision, but it's very much, understood by us that we have two-sided risks and we have to man uh, manage them. So what about the recovery in the Eurozone, President Lagarde? It, it's also been pretty resilient, especially on the unemployment front. How, how confident do you feel in sticking this soft landing? Well, we reached a level of confidence uh, back in June when we decided to actually cut rates by 25 basis points. But as I said in the opening remarks, uh, it's not something that is taken for granted, that is a given, and we're going to re-examine each and every step of the way whether that confidence is actually continuously reinforced in order to continue on that path. And it's, I mean, the remarks by uh, Chair Powell made me really reinforce my points about data, uh, because we are navigating in this universe of one risk versus the other, but where data is so important. And data is so important because we proceed always with the, the burden of the lag of, of time, uh, whether it's um, the impact of our policy decisions, whether it's the impact of wages, whether it's the, 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 the sort of 
on-time data or not, all of that has to be taken into account and analyzed in details so that we can feel really confident that we can go forward. At the same time, there are also political risks. Um, certainly, they're front and center. It was nice of all the authorities to make elections all happen this week, um, certainly in France and in England. President Lagarde, is there anything the ECB can do to shield the rest of the Eurozone from feeling any negative impact from a divided government in France or from whatever the result is of the French election in a negative way? I thank you so much for your question. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be a surprise. Because, because I'm not going to comment on, on the political situation of any of the member states, particularly those that are facing elections at the moment. But, you know, obviously, um, the European Central Bank has to do what it has to do. Our mandate is price stability. Price stability uh, is obviously relying on financial stability. And we are attentive to that because this is part of our job. And we will continue to do so. Do the, does the rise in French bond yields look worrisome at all? Now, these are the things that uh, we, we monitor. This is part of the job. It's, uh, it, you know, it's not particularly at this point in time. We do that all the time. And we are very attentive. You have fought hard for the central bank's independence in Brazil. And yet, now you are the subject of many attacks from President Lula. And so I'm wondering how you're dealing with attacks that. Attacks from me? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, President Campos. Ah. Attacks from President Lula. I think he called you an, an adversary and an enemy. Yes, well, I, I think uh, as, a, as, as a central banker, we have to get away from the, from the political arena and try to um, go on uh, with the technical job. And I think what we did, I think, is a living proof that everything that was done was very technical. So during the elections in which Lula was elected, the incumbent uh, president, uh, in his last year of mandate, we increased rates uh, in a cycle that went from 2% to 13.75%. That's the biggest increase in rates in an election year in the history of any emerging markets. So if that is not a proof that you are uh, independent uh, and you acted uh, autonomously, uh, it's difficult to find another example like that. So I think all this narrative that the central bank uh, has been political, um, I think we have to get away from that and explain what we're doing. And I think what we're doing has been very technical. The last decision was unanimous, and we now have four members in the board that were um, chosen by, by the current president. And I think what, what we need to separate it was what is the political narrative and what is the technical job that we need, that we need to do. And I think uh, history will tell and time will tell that the job was done in the best we could do with the data that we had at hand, and that was in the most technical way, and it was done uh, in, 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 a, in a group of people that actually analyzed all the data and that worked very, uh, very um, judiciously to, to, um, to be able to um, get to the conclusions that we did. Chair Powell, do you have any, yeah. any advice for him? You've been through some um, attacks from I, I, have, I have no advice. I, I, I will say, though, <laughs> to put it in my words, uh, you know, we've been given this great responsibility and great powers, and really important that we get it right. And we've been told to stay out of politics and just do do your job, do your job, and that's what we do. We don't we don't try to get involved in issues that are not our issues. And in particular, we we're just focused on our goals and getting through that. And if we do that and do it well. I will say in the United States, there's very broad support for an independent Fed in both political parties on both sides of Capitol Hill and everywhere. I, I, don't, I don't think uh, that that's really in question, as long as we just are seen to be doing our job and, and staying on task at all times. Can I say something? Yes, please. I think that there are countries where governors do exactly what Chair Powell said, <laughs> and yet, get blamed, criticized, and I think that for some it uh, takes courage to do the job in addition to being a good, excellent technical expert. But I do wonder if you're concerned, because your term ends, President Campos, at the end of the year, and I, I don't, it doesn't seem like President Lula is gonna reappoint you. So do you worry about the independence of the central bank? So first, um, 
I was never up for reappointment, regardless of who won the elections, and I've said that from the very beginning. When I helped design the independence law, I actually tried not to have the reappointment possibility in the law. And for me, the reason was that I didn't want that the president of the central bank at any circumstance would have any incentives to bend his knee in order to have any kind of re-election. So that, that we need to make that very clear. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, there is actually a, prim a risk premium down in the curve, and I think it has um, been elevated in the last couple of weeks as to an uncertainty of what happens uh, when um, the next uh, leadership or the next team takes place. But this in Brazil is done very slowly because the, central, the president can change two directors every year and we have eight directors plus the president. So right now we have four directors that were appointed by the current government. And the last uh, uh, decision, monetary decision, was unanimous. So I think what we did in the last decisions proved that there was, the group is very cohesive in trying to find a technical solution for the country. So I understand there is a risk premium and there is always this uncertainty, but I think the group that we have, uh, which is uh, composed of eight directors plus uh, a governor, voted unanimous, unanimously, understanding that that was the best for the country at that time. And so I think I understand that there is a risk premium, but I think uh, with time that risk premium will try with them to decrease. There, there are concerns in the United States about Fed independence. If President Trump gets elected, there have been reports that he's looking at that issue. Obviously, you've been subject of attacks before. What is your level of concern about that? I am not focused on that at all. <clears throat> and that's, that's not just a talking point. I, I, I really think that we just keep doing our jobs. I mean, the US economy, we have 4% unemployment. It's growing at 2%. Inflation's at 2.6%. Let's keep that going. Let's do our jobs. History will judge. I think if we, if we can keep things on that path, that's, that's what I'm focused on. That's the only thing I'm focused on. And I, as I mentioned, I, I do think support for the Fed's independence is very high where it really matters on Capitol Hill in both political parties among the leaders and, and most of the following. And so I, I worry about getting the job right. That's what I worry about. I know you guys don't want to touch politics, but President <laughs> Lagarde, it does bring into focus the fiscal policies, right? We heard President Campos say it. There are concerns about the deficits in France, if, if the far right should win. There are concerns in the United States about the deficits. So I do wonder if you have something to say or to warn on the, on the fiscal front as it relates to making your inflation fight harder. Well, fiscal matters enormously, true. And uh, it matters in, in two different ways from my perspective. It matters from a sort of conjunctural type of way, and thank goodness the European authorities have agreed on the, the fiscal governance that will take over after the Growth and Stability Pact has been um, replaced, has been suspended and, and now completely replaced. So there is a framework within which members of the European Union have to operate, have to control the direction of their debt, have to make sure that it is uh, sustainable going forward through the efforts that they deploy. And, uh, and have to keep their deficit um, on watch. With enough flexibility, and that's the second part of fiscal spending that I'm concerned about, with sufficient of an impact, on, of a focus on uh, productivity, on growth, of investment that will be conducive to both. And my hope is that in addition to operating within the European fiscal uh, framework, which has been agreed by all European members. In addition to that, countries will actually look at the structural changes that they have to uh, either continue to uh, have in their arsenal of tools, but also that they will continue to improve going forward, because I, I regard that as uh, critically important for productivity purposes, which we are lagging behind and have been lagging behind for a long time. So we're not so worried about fiscal expectations as Roberto was saying uh, for Brazil or emerging market economies, but we're very concerned about the, the fiscal rules that have to be respected within the European Union and the structural reforms that will be conducive, hopefully, to productivity improvement going forward, because that's the only way for Europe to actually uh, remain strong and, uh, and 
you know, thrive in uh, those changing circumstances and transformations that we have talked about. And I know, I know you're allergic to fiscal policy, Chair Powell, but I have heard you talk about the unsustainable debt burden of the United States. And, and even lately, there's been a sell-off in treasuries after increasing odds that President Trump will be reelected, that there might be a sweep of either party. Doesn't that make you nervous when it comes to the progress you've had on inflation if we do see more expansionary fiscal policy, more deficit, bigger deficits, bigger debt loads? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the traditional answer to some extent, and that is that uh, you know, we just know fiscal policy is a job for elected people. We're not elected people, so we don't comment on it, and particularly in advance of, of a presidential election. We're not, not commenting on any, anyone's particular policies one way or the other. I will say more broadly, though, the United States is running a very large deficit at a time when we're at full employment, and it, it just is, it, the level of debt that we have is not unsustainable. The path that we're on is unsustainable. That's completely non-controversial. I would have thought that uh, this, this is something that should be a, a top level issue. And you do hear this from a lot of elected officials, but it should be a real focus going forward is how do we get back to a sustainable path? Because you can't run these kinds of deficits in really in, in good, good economic times uh, for very long. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I, 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 can't, I can't really speak to the time, but in the longer run, we'll have to do something sooner or later, and sooner will be better than later. President Kampa? Yeah, um, let's do a basic, a basic exercise. If you look at the total debt combined, just sovereign debt of US plus Europe plus Japan, that's 64% of the total global debt. That went, in, the, in terms of cost of service debt debt, it went from 1.1, 1 1.2% 1 .1 before the pandemic to around 3.3% right now. But then you add the 25% of GDP to that debt, which was the cost of facing the pandemic. So we have a much higher debt and a much, much higher cost of servicing, service the debt. So I think there was an aspect globally um, that, that is the extraction of liquidity that cumulative will have an effect in the market that sometimes is not um, pricing correctly. Um, and if you think about what we have to do right now, we have to pay for the cost of the transfer programs that we did. We need to pay for the cost of the green transition, which is somewhat expensive. We need to pay for the cost of the fragmentation, which you look at the surveys and it's very uh, costly for companies and for governments. We need to pay for the cost of the low-income countries that spent very little during the pandemic and now need support. We need to pay for the cost of demographics. And there is a surge in consumption of energy that needs to be paid because of the innovation. So we have a lot of bills to pay. So we are, we, a lot of bills to pay. We are at the highest level of debt that we've had in a long time. And I think it's some, sometimes I stop, I, I stop and I think it's, it's time for us globally um, to think about a way uh, to get to some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, stable trajectory of the debt in, in the next couple of years. And it's not one country or the other. It's something that we need to do collectively because the global, global debt is very high and it's gonna start taking a lot of liquidity from the markets. And the ones that will feel the effect are not the advanced economies, are the emerging right. economies, emerging market economies. And the low-income countries are feeling that effect already. And you think the market is mispricing this risk? I think the market was mispricing a little bit the fact that if you have higher rates for longer, the effect from extracting liquidity, depending on how much longer you're going to have these high rates, um, I think the risk is higher than what the market is pricing us. I also wanted to ask you, President Campos, about China, because you have a pretty good view. It's such a big trading partner for you. What's going on there? How, how much is China's economy slowing? I, I'm not sure I'm very equipped to, to tell you what's happening in China. I can tell you that it's that is very important for a lot of emerging market economies. It's very important for Brazil. Uh, we are a very big exporter of you know, food items and iron ore. So China is a very big uh, trade partner uh, with Brazil. And uh, it has been for a while. And depending, regardless of the government, it's important to, uh, to understand that that is a very important tie to Brazil. Um, the one thing that we look from, from looking from, from far away is we're trying to see what are the policies that China is doing, what is, it, what is the focus, and what is the, the impact that this new policy will have for us. Um, but because we support mainly food items and iron ore, we don't see that as a big threat. I think some other countries will have 
a, um, a, different, a different understanding of what this impact will be. Yeah, I mean, there's also trade barriers that are going up, President Lagarde, tariffs. I mean, in, in our election, we're talking about potentially more tariffs. Are you, are you seeing that in terms of growth and inflationary impact? Well, we're not seeing yet more tariffs than what had been decided back you know, eight years ago and which was consistently um, maintained uh, later on in relation to certain products. So that, that, for the moment, is stable. What is not stable at all is the number of protective measures, occasionally uh, non-compliance with WTO rules, uh, the level of disputes that are brought before the WTO, which is not in a position to resolve them because they are not equipped with the uh, dispute resolution uh, mechanism, and magistrates have not been appointed to that effect. We've had more than 3,000 protect trade protective measures decided in the last two years, and that is like five times what is the normal average of measures that are decided. So that's a concern, and it's a concern because uh, trade has been fueling growth, and because Europe at large is not a small open economy, it's a large open economy, and trade restrictions are going to affect Europe much more so than other countries that operate without uh, this degree of opening and, uh, and vulnerability in a way. But the second reason I'm concerned about it is that typically trade is conducive to innovation. Innovation is necessary for productivity. And I think that the combination of reduced trade on growth and the impact of trade on the capacity to innovate and to improve productivity is a, a, a vulnerability for Europe and one that we have to address uh, very forcefully if we want to win this battle of productivity. So and it's it, not independent from inflation. I'm not getting away from my topic, but uh, it's, it's one that is clearly a concern on the horizon. But, and, it, and it could be inflationary. I mean, 10% 10, 10 across the board tariffs, Chair Powell, inflationary? Well, of course, I'm not going to be scoring any potential uh, political proposals which have been talked about. I'm just not, this is not our, not our job to do that. Also, almost anything affects the economy. Trade affects the economy, immigration, energy policy. Those are not our jobs. There are other agencies that do those jobs. We do maximum employment price stability. So in our, in our political economy, we, we stay out of that. Right. But, uh, but it has implications for price stability, surely, <laughs> and maximum employment. Again, we're not, we're not looking to be, this is exactly what we're not looking mm -hmm. to do, which is Understood. to become players on issues like tariffs. I mean, because it affects, I mean, literally everything. All these things affect inflation and jobs. But notwithstanding that, there are others in the elected government who are responsible for trade policy. We don't comment, that's all. Understood. <laughs> so, so back to your job then. There is this debate um, and among the Fed and other central bankers about where policy rates are going, our starred, the neutral rate, what, the, what, what that rate should look like, and whether it's different after COVID. What do you think? Can we go back to trade? Yeah, no. Sure. <laughs> Please. <laughs> So, <clears throat> our star. Uh, I guess I would start by saying that um, uh, the thing that we write down as part of our summary of economic projections and the thing that economists mean by our star is a longer run concept. It's, it's the rate of interest that would hold the economy at equilibrium at a time when we're at stable prices and maximum employment and there are no shocks hitting the economy. So, this is not the economy today. So, the first thing to say is that when we're sitting in, in the boardroom in Washington thinking about whether our policy rate is the appropriate rate for this economy right now, we're not battling over what long run our star is because this is a different economy. This is a, an economy that's still recovering from the pandemic. And so many forces are pushing it this way and that way and, and there's really not a lot of precedent. So it's, it's a very challenging time, but it's not, the, the question, the R star question is a really interesting question and that is, are we going to go back to the very low levels of neutral rates that we had in the recovery of the global financial crisis, or we, are we going to go part of the way back from today's high rates to that? <laughs> and you know, intuitively, most people think that we won't go back to those very, very low rates that we saw uh, you know, during the global financial crisis recovery period, but we don't really know. I mean, the, those, the neutral rate has moved around, we think, 
by slow moving, longer run forces, demographics, technology, um, productivity over time, uh, all of those things move, move, um, move it around. Uh, ultimately the balance between savings and investment. So it's a great conversation to have, but honestly, when we're, when we're looking at policy in the, in the boardroom, it's how is, our, uh, how is our policy affecting today's economy? And do we think we're getting the results that we want? And you know, by and large, in a, in a world where this isn't a world of precision, we think we are. We're getting a gradually cooling economy, a gradually cooling labor market, progress on inflation, 4% unemployment, 2% growth. We're getting kind of what we would want to have. And so, so that's, I, and I, I worry that some people, no one in this room, but some people think that the R star debate is the thing that dictates our, our assessment of how restrictive policy is. It's really not. Unless, think you think, unless you think that the long run rate is the same as today's rate. I think that investors are trying to figure out, though, where you're going to end up and what the policy path looks like once you start cutting rates. And it becomes important then. No, I agree. It does. Yeah. It's where, what, will we, what will we discover to be? We'll find it empirically. What will we discover it to be? And I, you know, I think um, there's a debate going on. There are people who very, feel very strongly that it hasn't changed and that it has changed. And ultimately, it's unknowable. It does matter for the longer run. It matters for you know where where rates all settle out. But it isn't doesn't matter much for policy decisions today, which are the ones we're actually right. making. I guess we want to know if there are like ten high, ten cuts coming or fifteen cuts. I mean, do you think President Campos it's changed post COVID? Are you dealing with a different economy? So the R star story for emerging market countries is a little bit different. So for example, if you look at if you had a table of countries of Latin America, you would find that at least the models internally used by their own central banks, in some cases you had RSR going higher, like Brazil, from three to four and a half. But in some cases you actually had RSR going lower. So the question is, what is um, the short-term view and what is the long-term view, as Chairman um, uh, Jay described? And I think for us it's more like trying to understand what is the structural reason for the neutral rate in Brazil to be so high, 4.5% real time, is really, is, is, real, is really high. And I think a lot of it has a lot of structural elements from the past, but it has intensified during the pandemic. Um, and you could go and talk about the amount of subsidized credit, you can talk about the trajectory of the debt, you can talk about productivity. For example, when you look at productivity, there is one thing that not a lot of people talk about, which is in the need for raising money, um, sometimes the adjustment is done on the revenue side. When you do the adjustment on the revenue side, if you look at what's being done in emerging market countries, and even in some advanced economies, you tend to go back and tax capital more than labor, because it's very hard to tax labor coming out of a pandemic. If you tax more capital than labor, and this has already been happening for a while now globally, and especially in emerging market, then um, you introduce another element that will bring productivity lower. So when you look at the causes of the of the neutral rate to be so high structurally, that's, I think, what we need to work on. And Brazil has done a lot of reforms. Mm -hmm. you know, we have done reforms. And I think if you compare to other EM countries, Brazil was actually able to do reforms in the middle of the pandemic. We did the social security reform. We are doing a tax reform. We did the labor reform, all in the middle of the pandemic. But, it's, but it's still, when you look at the efficiency of what was done, the end result seems to be that our structural rate is still too, our neutral rate, our star is too, too, too high. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to go on and talk about what are the reforms that are needed uh, in the medium term to make sure that we have uh, a structural rate, a neutral rate that is lower than we have right now. President Lagarde, do you ever see a world where we get back to near zero interest rates absent a crisis? Do I think we're heading towards that? Hmm. That's, in my view at this point in time, it's, it's very unlikely, but uh, it's not something that I would want to pass judgment on. What I can tell you is that when we start having that conversation that Chair Powell described perfectly well and that I would completely subscribe to, uh, I would be relieved because it would mean that we are getting closer to where we need to be. It would mean that we do not have any shock um, suffered by the economy, nor on the immediate horizon. So that would be good news. But we are certainly not at this stage, and this is not the work that we do when we set our, our policies going forward. One thing that's been moving fast and has the potential to impact economies is generative AI. And I know we started talking about it a little bit here on stage last year. It was, it was early. But things have moved, President Lagarde. So how, how are you thinking about any 
impact on growth or productivity or inflation of what's happening in technology? Why, well, Sarah, that's, that's a subject for which we need another hour because okay. there are so many questions uh, about it. Uh, number one, there has to be some regulatory framework within which AI and generative AI in particular, especially if it's in the hands of a, a small oligopole of companies, is actually uh, organized in order to protect a number of uh, rights and protection of, of citizens. That's, I would start from that, which is not where we are for the moment, although there are attempts to organize in a better way, as was the case with uh, internet, on a global basis, the use of generative AI. So point number one. Point number two, and I, I will let Roberto talk to that point because he's more of an expert than I am, <laughs> the question of how much energy is used in order to test uh, large language models is really something that is not often on, on the, uh, on, in discussion, and yet it matters enormously. Uh, third, the impact that AI will have on, on, on growth, on inflation, on productivity, I think is yet uh, to, be, to be determined. Uh, I think most people would agree that it will have an impact throughout uh, the ladder of jobs in most segments of the economy, uh, in areas where mechanical developments have not historically affected jobs in particular, and it will require significant amount of training and constant upskilling of, um, of people so that they can adjust to artificial intelligence, use it, and not be victims of it. I would add to that that I think we at the ECB are using artificial intelligence, uh, try to do it in a, in a safe environment without being uh, hostage to those companies that would like to have access to the most private of our data. So it does require a cautious management and, uh, and enough control without you know, preventing the innovation and the creativity that people can apply uh, in, in the use of these tools. You use it in, in models? How do you use it? We use it in models, we use it in, uh, you know, whenever we need a lot of language mining and, uh, and whether it's structured or unstructured data, for that matter, we, we use it and, uh, and we are constantly pushing the, the frontiers of that. Uh, but as I said, cautiously, because we need to protect data and, and we need to make sure that there is enough human judgment involved in the process of this use of artificial intelligence so that we are not either hostage uh, to, to the mechanics itself. Do you think that, that fears over generative AI, Chair Powell, rendering certain jobs or industries absolute, absolute are, are, are legit? And is there anything a central bank can do? Um, I don't think we know. So uh, you see this massive investment boom. You see you know, serious people in the private sector and the public sector. There's a sense of something big coming here. And you know, it feels like what that will be is it will eliminate some jobs, it will create some new jobs. And the question really is for, for many people who uh, will, will it augment their labor and make them more productive or will it eliminate their job? And I, I just don't think, we, I don't think we know that. It's too early to say. Um, there's not a lot a central bank can do about, about that. You know, this, is, this is really a job for, uh, we, we can supervise our financial institutions and things like that to make sure that, you know, that they understand what they're doing with all different kinds of technology. But um, it, also, like, like everybody else, we're, you know, we're meeting with all the experts and, and uh, asking ourselves what will be the effects on productivity, on inflation, on growth, and you know, will it be enormously displacing, and if so, of whom? You know, this, this one thought is that it'll be more people doing white-collar jobs who are you know, writing press releases and things like that. So we just don't know. It's something we're investing a lot of time and effort we're not using generative AI. We, you know, we're very carefully looking at that. You know, other forms of earlier forms of AI are, are in fairly common use in American business, and I believe we use some of that. What about you, President Campos? I know you're focused on the energy needs as well. Well, uh, first, I think when you look at the surveys that we have, and we have plenty now on the use of AI on companies, what you have in terms of um, empirical evidence up to date is that the companies that use AI to enhance uh, existing labor have had better results than companies that have replaced labor for AI. So that's something that we know. It doesn't mean that some jobs won't be replaced by others, uh, as it was said. 
But I think what we need to understand is um, what we are seeing basically is an increase in the ability of processing data and storing data. So it's basically computer power and the, being, and, and the ability to, to store data. And that's very uh, energy consuming. You have a couple of dimensions that you need to look in. You look to privacy, where is the limit, uh, and um, what is the taxonomy of using this once it becomes a global instrument? What is the taxonomy of using this? Because you could be talking about data centers being placed in countries that have cheap energy to produce services for countries that have more expensive energy. So uh, once you start crossing the frontiers, thinking about how you're going to do this movement globally, I think there's a lot of consequences. And one of which I think is you're going to have very unequal uh, growth between the countries that are more on the edge of producing this technology and the countries that are not. And, and the energy consumption also be very unequal. So I think globally, we need to look at how we're going to connect the dots and create more or less a taxonomy for this, develop to be, this development to be sustainable. In the minutes that we have left, I want to do sort of a quick lightning round um, of questions. Uh, mainly, you know, we've been t we talked about opportunities, we talked about, about economies. What about the biggest risk facing your economies? And I, and I do wonder if, if they're the same or different. Chair Powell, what's the biggest risk facing the US economy right now? Yeah, I mean, I traditionally have said cyber risk to that because it's, you know, it just, it's, uh, we know how to deal with credit risk. We know how to deal with lots of kinds of risk, you know, market dysfunction, things like that. But we haven't really had a big successful cyber attack on a financial market utility or a bank. Good. And th that's the kind of thing which I think is, uh, you know, the stuff of uh, lying awake at night. I would also, today though, honestly, Really, it is just the balance that we talked about, getting the balance on monetary policy right during this critical period. That's, that's really what, what I think about in the wee hours. President Lagarde? Same thing. Really? <laughs> really? Cyber risk? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I'm saying that touching wood, actually, and I wish, I'd, yeah. Uh -huh. um, because it's one, if, if you ask, if you ask the financial sector, if you ask banks with which we, are, we in, inter, interact a lot, sometimes much to their chagrin, but eventually to their satisfaction in the long run, I'm sure, because we supervise them carefully. Uh, but typically, uh, that's, that's a risk that they flag as one of their, their top, top priority risk, and on which I think uh, we need to constantly improve the level of coordination, first, second, third line of defense, and best way to respond to those. Now, clearly, I'm concerned um, as, as a person more than as president of the ECB about the backlash that there is against um, the fight against climate change. And uh, some would argue that it has nothing to do with uh, central banking, but I would contend that this is um, actually not the case. It does <coughs> have a ramification impact that we should be mindful about, but it's, it's a risk that, uh, that is there and that, uh, that will come to haunt us if we don't do much about it. I thought you were going to say geopolitical risk. That's there too, right, facing Europe? Geopolitical risks as defined by uh, uh, Maurizio earlier on. No, who is it? Yeah, Maurizio. We yeah. heard a lot about geopolitical uh, risk. It's, it's there, and it's, uh, it's just on, on the doorstep of, uh, of Europe. When you look at, at uh, this horrible war against Ukraine, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a major risk which is out there and which um, is hurting those on the ground and, uh, and uh, the neighboring countries in particular. What's, the, what's your biggest risk? Uh, if you look at what markets price today, they will probably, um, at least for part of Yemen, especially for Brazil, the, part, the conclusion would clearly be that the main risk is, is fiscal. But I think that comes and goes, and it has to do with growth and productivity and a lot of other things. I think there is one other risk that, that I see, and it's not very tangible, which is the polarization that we live today. If we think about the amount of time that we spent on some social uh, issues that are connected to polarization, and that are not that meaningful to produce well-being of the society, I worry a lot about that. Yeah. So if we're sitting here on stage in one year from now, which we hopefully are, the inflation rate in the US will be? 
you know, mid to low twos. That's kind of, we're mid twos now. Yeah, well, we have one month at 2.6. And, you know, we had a brief visit to the low twos uh, at the end of, but I mean, I mean, sustainably, durably, underlying inflation between two and two and a half is what I would say. That would be, that would be a great outcome. By Headline PCE. Year. Yeah. President Lagarde, one year from now? One year from now, I would say low twos. We are 2.5, latest reading, and as I said, bumpy um, on the way ahead, but uh, yeah, low twos. You've been closer to 4%, President Campos, right lately. So where do you think you are in, in a year from now? Well, I, I won't be in the central bank well, a right. year from now. <laughs> <laughs> but, we already established that, yeah. But, uh, but I, I think that uh, the, the, the work that's being done is very technical. Um, I'm confident that we'll continue to be that way. And I think when you look at expected inflation today, I think it has a disconnect with the current inflation and it has a disconnect with the fundamentals that we have in Brazil. So I'm confident that uh, the, the future inflation will be lower than the expected inflation. In other words, I think uh, what the market's pricing today um, is not um, in sync with the reality. What about the unemployment rate? We're, we're going to go full dot plot here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'd be happy if it were just right where it is now. That would be a good outcome. Plus or minus a couple of tenths would be, would be good. Is that likely? Yeah, I think it's reasonable. It's starting to rise. It's moved up from 3.4. We touched 3.4, so we're up to 4, but 4 is still a very low level. You know, it's been a long time since, if you take, if you, the last time we were at 4 or below for this long is, you know, it was, I was a teenager a long time ago. Also, unemployment rate in Europe, it's been, what, healthy, 6.5%? Historical percent? low, yeah. and I hope it stays there a year from now. What's the unemployment rate in Brazil? Well, um, it's close to 7% now, which is very low in, in, uh, when you look at the, our history. Um, I think probably we'll go up a little bit, but not too much. But I think what we need to look at is the participation rate. So we, we just published a study that shows that the transfer programs have an impact in the participation rate. Our participation rate was down, and then it's recovering a little bit at the margin. And I think it would be very important to understand what is the dynamics of the participation rate going further. And finally, Chair Powell, were you, um, were you a, a two-cut dot or a one-cut dot for 2024? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, all of you. Thank for you. Participating. I tried. This brings us to the end of this special episode where ECB President Christine Lagarde, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell and Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, Roberto Compas Neto, discussed monetary policy in an era of transformation here at the ECB Forum on Central Banking in Sintra, Portugal. You've been listening to the ECB Podcast with Paul Gordon. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. And in the spirit of Europe, I'd like to end in Swedish and say, hey, Dor. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>